Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Enter the world of forensic science, the science of crime, where a suspect's guilt or innocence can hang on a single piece of evidence. What does handwriting say about us? Is our handwriting as unique as fingerprints? Our first exhibit A? This is all I can show you for now. Her name was Debbie. She was 30, a divorcee and ex-model with a memorable giggle. His name was Jeff. He was 26, a young Turk who'd quit school in the eighth grade and was now pulling down 150 Gs. It was the best of times. They both liked to powder their nose from the inside. Life in the fast lane was good. She worked in accounting. He sold used cars. And despite conventional wisdom about dating people you work with, they began to fall in love. Everyone knew. Everyone knew when Debbie and Jeff snuck off to Hawaii. Everyone knew that Martin Miller the car jockey babysat Debbie's dog. Everyone knew when Debbie and Jeff moved in together. Everyone knew when their relationship hit a speed bump. And everyone knew that Jeff was moving out that Saturday. According to Jeff, he arrived just after lunch. Nothing prepares him for what's inside. attempts to revive her. As he waits for police, he gets another shock. Exhibit A, three words scrawled with what appears to be red lipstick. Who wrote them? Bob Strafty, the detective who headed the investigation, picks up the story. We don't know what we're dealing with. We don't know the cause of death. Um, a few things we do know. The door was locked, and the door had not been forced open. Now, if that be the case, why would there appear to be a robbery? Why would this place be in a 
state of disarray. A lot of things didn't make sense initially. And then you start to examine more closely and uh, this disarray of the apartment, my partner and I reached the uh, decision that this was staged. This, this wasn't a break-in or a robbery or a theft, but the apartment, it was our opinion, the apartment was made to look that way. The kitchen table suggests Debbie may have been in the midst of doing laundry. In fact, police find three machines full of wet clothes in the downstairs laundry room. But dominating their investigation is the mirror. But at every homicide scene, the killer leaves something or the killer takes something away. And that was very true in this case. Can you use either of those parameters to help you lead you to the perpetrator. In this case, the killer had left a message on the mirror. Can we interpret that writing and apply that to a suspect? An ident officer finds a tube of lipstick that may have been used on the mirror. It'll be tested for color and dusted for fingerprints. The bedroom is combed for clues. Back at the station house, Jeff is one of the first people detectives interview. He concedes strange things have been happening lately. People have been calling and hanging up. Officer Hanson called the rental office and warned them not to lease an apartment to Jeff because he was a drug user. Jeff called the police. There is no Officer Hanson. Even though Debbie was with him for some of those times, he suspects she was behind it all. And that was one of the reasons he wanted to break up. Detectives asked how she had taken the breakup. Miserable, Jeff admits. The week before, she asked him if taking eight sleeping pills was enough to kill herself. Another time, she told him if he left, she'd commit suicide. Maybe that's why she suddenly gave away her beloved dog to her mother just yesterday. Surely the police weren't thinking it was murder. He was concerned, he said, because of the mirror. The phrase, Jeff, you're next, sounded like something Debbie would write. At least, that's what he wanted to believe, because it was less scary. Had the dead woman written the message, then killed herself? To find out, we have to look into Exhibit A. Now there's handwriting, cursive, connected handwriting. How unique is it? Completely unique to yourself. We all have a uniqueness in our handwriting. We place our own trademarks on our handwriting. It's the product of all those years of practice that your brain now knows how to make every one of these letters, knows how to connect them, knows what proportions it likes to see. It's your artistic ability, your uh, patterns that have been developed over such a long time that your brain automatically has you, forces you to use over and over again. Take an average classroom. Kids start to learn how to write trying to model the handwriting above the blackboard. But even after a very short time, when a teacher collects the papers, she can probably identify handwriting of each student without looking at the name. By the time we've graduated high school, our handwriting is basically set. But what a question a doc document examiner does in most circumstances is to, uh, well, in the, in the everyday nuts and bolts work, is to compare questioned writing with known handwriting specimens, making a physical comparison between these handwritings uh, to determine whether they were written by the same person or whether they weren't written by the same person, just as important. When the victim's handwriting was compared to the handwriting on the mirror, well, see for yourself. 
no match. But if the victim didn't write this, who did? Was it a suicide or was it murder? As with all questionable deaths, Debbie's body was transported to the morgue to be autopsied. Dead bodies always tell stories, and one keeps one's options open until the autopsy and the findings are completed. There was an extremely fine amount of abrasion or scraping of the top layers of the skin across the front of the neck. And as the diagram shows, there are extensive uh, areas of bruising on the back of this victim and the obvious uh, message at the end of the autopsy was that this woman didn't strangle herself. McCall's conclusion is that the victim had been manually strangled from the rear with the assailant possibly kneeling on her back as he choked her. Also, the victim may have been wearing a kerchief around her neck at the time of her death and the assailant pulled it tight. But the way the body was found suggests something else. The positioning of the body, the at rest position, for lack of a better description, this isn't someone who hates this girl. This isn't your mad sexual predator that leaves a girl like this. So now as things are starting to add up, you're, you're drawing a, a profile, for lack of a better word, of who is here. Somebody who doesn't really hate her. Somebody who she probably let in. Somebody who left his calling card with the note on the mirror. Things are starting to develop. We're a long way from identifying a suspect, but we're starting to uh, get a profile. The laboratory at the forensic center finds cocaine in the victim's blood, and a vaginal swab reveals semen. The police question Jeff again. He tells them that on that Friday night, he'd come over to finish packing. It had gotten late, and they had ended up making love. The morning of the murder, as he was about to pick up the moving van, Debbie begged him to let her do his laundry. He said she didn't have to. That was the last time he saw her alive. He swears he spent the rest of the morning getting the move together. Detective Strathy found out from the phone company that someone had called the victim from Montreal and spoken 42 seconds at 10.56 a.m. It was one of Jeff's car contacts, but he remembered the victim saying she planned to get really drunk that night at a place called Illusions. The plan had been to go with a couple of girlfriends and maybe Martin Miller, the car jockey. Two days after the murder, Martin shows up for work wearing a cross he claims Debbie gave him for babysitting her dog when she went to Hawaii. But a co-worker remembers Debbie wearing the cross the week before. Martin Miller gassed cars and he washed cars. That was his role. And he'd see her in the accounting department. And she, in fact, she was an attractive, nice lady. And Martin, I think, aspired to be in her company. Miller claims he got teased about Debbie, but it was really nothing. Oh, he liked her, but she was too old for him. Too old to think of as a girlfriend. But you know, he liked her a heck of a lot. When the topic eases into his whereabouts on the day of the murder, Miller answers he drove around with a friend named Tony, and they caught breakfast at the Grenadier restaurant in the middle of Hyde Park. I happened to grow up in the West End, and I'm familiar with the Grenadier restaurant. And I, at that time, it was seasonal. And I knew it not to be open at that time. And when he mentioned he was in the Grenadier restaurant with his friend, we pursued that as to the particulars of their visit to the restaurant. But a wire does not a murderer make. So Strathy calls Tony to get his side of the alibi. And he goes through the same story. Now, the particulars of what they did in the restaurant were like years apart, mainly because it didn't happen. And an interview of 30 to 45 minutes, we concluded it. 
And uh, just before concluding it, my partner asked him, looked him in the eye and said, have you told us the truth? And he started crying and he said, no, I've lied to you. He wanted to do the interview over again. We did. And he says, Martin phoned him and told him to tell us that they were together that morning, but he wasn't with them. Police get Tony to call Miller and tell him police want to talk to him. What should he do? Miller tells Tony not to sweat it. He brags about how the police bought everything he told them and how stupid they are. Of course, police were listening in. Miller still lives at home. During the interview with police, he shows them a photo of Debbie's dog, which Debbie supposedly gave him for dog sitting the time she and Jeff went to Hawaii. But it turns out Debbie's mother only gave her the photo on the Friday, and Jeff remembers seeing it there the Saturday of the murder. Meanwhile, a witness in the building claims to have seen Debbie in the elevator on that Saturday morning with a guy, a head and a neck taller. When police question Miller, he starts squirming, saying he's experiencing haziness. Strathy asks Miller if it was possible he went to Debbie's that Saturday morning. His answers show a confused state of mind. Well, it could have been totally possible. Well, just to let myself to, uh, you know, okay, I can't get a hold of her. I'll go and see if they're there. Well, can you? Can you help us then on that Saturday morning? I mean, we know you're an early riser. Yeah, sure. Right. We know you weren't with Tony. Oh, Jesus, come on, mine, think. In a dazed way, Miller eventually admits that, yeah, maybe he took the subway out there around 11. Maybe he helped her with her laundry, but then he left. The next interview is even more significant. I felt assured that Martin did it, but why won't he tell me he did it? You know, things are piling up on Martin. What am I missing? What's really impeding the case is that police lack any physical evidence. Right after the murder, Debbie's bedroom was combed for clues. A forensic ident officer had found palm prints on the wall at the head of the bed and lifted a right thumbprint and a full right hand off the mirror. And at the base of the building had found a tube of lipstick. The laser examination failed to detect any prints on the lipstick tube, and in regards to the mirror and the wall in the apartment, uh, there were no identifiable fingerprints belonging to the victim, Jeff or Martin Miller. The investigation seemed to be moving two steps forward, one step back. Given the lack of fingerprints and other evidence, police were thrust back on the mirror, the only piece of physical evidence that could put the suspect in the wrong place at the right time. There's a natural quality to those writings. Uh, they don't have the stilted appearance of a disguised writing. Let's face it, if, a, if you or I were the murderer and wrote a message on a mirror, I think I'd use my, my weak hand or I would, uh, I, I would do something. I'd write it upside down. I don't know, but I, I would hope that no one would, would ever be able to figure out who did it. But. Uh, Apparently, the person who wrote on this mirror didn't take that into consideration, and uh, I guess foremost in his mind was the message. I've got to get this message across, and uh, he wrote it in his normal hand. In this case, police suspected the writer's circumstance was standing, writing in lipstick in big print on a smooth surface, having just killed someone. In particular, I was very much impressed or uh, interested in this lowercase e in the word next. That e has a piece missing. Now, I would be really interested to find that same pattern in the letter e in the known, in the known specimens from this subject. If that existed, uh, I would think that would be quite a, a telling and weighty factor. The problem was that the known samples of Martin Miller's printing were in ballpoint pen, hard to compare with three words in lipstick. So Strathy has an idea. 
He called Miller's boss and asked him to get Miller to use a felt marker to make up some large signs for used cars. Now let's take a look at some of the writings that were presented to me as the known writings of the suspect in this case. Here's the word seat. Notice the top of the E in the word seat. It's missing its top. Here's an E in the word divided. The top is missing. Again, very obvious here that we have a two-stroke R, the same exact situation as what is on the mirror. The O, with its uh, joining at about 1 o'clock, and to a lesser degree, the U with the long tail. I believe with about 12 letters like this, the likelihood of someone else performing these motions would be about one in a quarter billion. Martin Miller certainly would not strike you as a classic killer. He's a, a very extremely polite fellow. He's extremely young psychologically. Uh, I believe he was 19 or 20 at the time of the uh, event. But he was much younger psychologically. And he had a great deal of respect, and you could maybe stretch that to love for the victim girl. And this was his queen. But on that Saturday morning, when Martin Miller went over to Debbie's and offered himself as a boyfriend replacement for Jeff, police surmised Debbie laughed in his face. That's when the warped part of him took over and he strangled her. Due to a legal technicality, Miller's lawyer was able to plea bargain the sentence down to manslaughter. And Miller, for the first time, conceded he had killed Debbie Wright. The stories on Exhibit A are based on actual cases. The names of the victims have been changed to protect their identities. The names of the guilty are real. <laughs> 